Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Anytime a city loses a sports team franchise, it initiates years of debate regarding why could such a thing have possibly occurred. Recent NFL teams have moved from cities such as St. Louis, Oakland, and Los Angeles. Usually there's an obvious reason for the departure, whether it is a low fan attendance or simply a better offer from the new host location. But always, and I'll repeat always, the departing club will leave behind some bad memories and hard feelings with its forgotten fans who are left simply to wonder why. 61 years ago this month, the Chicago Cardinals, the NFL's oldest franchise, suddenly pulled up its roots and left for St. Louis. Certainly, there have been rumors in the past that the team would leave the city at some time in the future. In fact, those rumors had swirled for decades, with possible destinations being Atlanta, Buffalo, Dallas, or even San Francisco. But fans of the team, located on the south side of the Windy City, were always comforted by the reassuring words of its owners that such a desertion would never, ever happen. So that's why on March 9, 1960, Cardinals fans were stunned by the rumors that the team would soon be departing for a new home in St. Louis. After being around the south side of Chicago since 1899, the team had established a solid presence in the National Football League. Despite a woeful 2-10 mark in 1959, which included a move of its home games from Comiskey Park to Soldier Field, as well as the team hosting a pair of home games, so to speak, in Minneapolis, supporters of the club were not overly concerned that a departure from the city would be imminent. They'd heard it all before. There had been similar rumors in the past, and Cardinals business manager Arch Wolf was quick to denounce the latest rumors on March 10th, stating, That story has been cropping up for some time. As far as I know, there is nothing to it. Later, team managing director Walter Wolfner added, There is not a grain of truth to the rumor. Someone is always trying to move us someplace. Some time ago, we were approached by a St. Louis group. We talked, but nothing came of it. We've been approached by many people, but we're still the Chicago Cardinals. Was there still hope 61 years ago today that the Cardinals would remain in Chicago? Chicagoans awakening on Saturday, March 12, 1960, and perhaps shaking off the effects of a long night, fraternizing with a few quarts of Drury's beer, enjoyed two nice choices on midday television. On Channel 7 at 11.30 a.m., one could watch Playboy's Penthouse, with guests such as Sammy Kahn, Francis Fay, and the entertaining Marty Rubenstein Trio. Over on Channel 9, football fans could view a new NFL program during the offseason that would focus on one of the more exciting games from the previous season in 1959. Local announcer Jack Brookhouse would host the program, which would debut with a recap on the recent matchup between the Cardinals and the Eagles from the past season. Unfortunately, Cardinals fans were beginning to fear that this would be the last opportunity for them to watch their beloved Southside Gritters. 2,000 miles west, the winter NFL meetings were ongoing in Los Angeles, with additional rumors emerging regarding the proposed move of the Cardinals to St. Louis. On March 12th, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported that Joe Griesdeck, the president of Falstaff Brewing Company in St. Louis, 
had just procured a minority ownership share of the Cardinals. Surely this would signify the imminent transfer of the franchise to St. Louis? Or was it a way for the current ownership to attract some much-needed financial support? However, Managing Director Walter Wolfner of the Cardinals continued to brush off such queries, indicating that Grisdeck's interest in the club had, quote, nothing whatsoever to do with any contemplated moves we might make, unquote. He also denied that George Hallis, owner of the Chicago Bears, had offered monetary incentives for the Cardinals to move out of Chicago, where both teams were crippled at the time by television blackouts. Regarding the purported Hallis offer, Wolfner stated, any stories to that effect are untrue. So, as of March 12, 1960, the Cardinals were still part of the Chicago landscape. However, there was still one more day of NFL meetings remaining in Los Angeles. In the midst of the strange handling by the Cards management of the perceived move by the Cards to St. Louis 61 years ago, Walter Wolfner took the opportunity while in the media spotlight to issue one more very bizarre statement. While continuing to deny that the Cardinals were moved to St. Louis, Wolfner, for some wacky reason, <laughs> decided to throw Cardinals coach Pop Ivey under the proverbial bus for a trade completed over a year earlier. On March 3, 1959, the Cardinals traded future Hall of Famer Ali Matson to the Rams for an astounding nine players. The exchange was engineered by then Rams general manager Pete Rozelle and certainly grabbed the attention of the NFL universe. Although in the long run, neither team benefited much from the massive trade since both clubs finished 2-10 in 1959. Wolfter eased away from the move rumors to suddenly criticize the Matson trade to the Los Angeles Times on March 13, 1960. He said, I went along with the coach but I'd never make that trade on my own. The Rams definitely got the best of the deal. What? And to make this comment a year later? As Wolfner continued to faint and dodge around the persistent move rumors, he once again embarrassed the proud franchise with another confusing, chaotic, and unnecessary statement. And yet for the loyal fan base who were simply seeking some answers, the worst, unfortunately, was yet to come. And so it was that finally on March 13, 1960, the Chicago Cardinals decided to take advantage of some attractive financial enticements and leave the south side of Chicago for the uncertain environment of St. Louis. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch proclaimed, the Chicago Cardinals, oldest club in the National Football League, were on their way to St. Louis today with only a few minor conditions remaining to be fulfilled. The Cards look forward to playing soon in a possible new 53,000-seat riverfront stadium. Until then, the Cardinals would line up initially in cozy Sportsman's Park. August Bush, the president of the St. Louis Baseball Cardinals, said, This is good news for St. Louis. The football Cardinals will give our city a year-round program of high-quality sports, he told the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. While Chicago Cardinals fans had feared this final announcement, it likely caught a few journalists by surprise due to the ever-present denials by Wolfner during the preceding week. The Tampa Florida Times noted, The shift of the cards to St. Louis, announced by Commissioner Pete Rozelle, came as a surprise. The day before, Managing Director Walter Wolfner had denied that such a widely rumored move was contemplated. In fact, the Times continued, Wolfner assured the press that he did not contemplate a move of the club and emphasized that such a thing would not happen in 1960. It would cost too much to move, he said, and such a move is not necessary. In the end, Wolfner succumbed to the lure of a monster $500,000 payday from the NFL for, quote, moving expenses, unquote. The Times added, a large part of it, Roselle disclosed, was underwritten by the rival Chicago Bears. Hmm. The donation was well worth it to the Bears and owner George Hallis since it would allow just one team to enjoy the previously blacked out and rapidly expanding Chicago television market. With both teams previously playing almost every Sunday in or out of Chicago, 
The rules at the time prohibited or blacked out the televising of any road games back to Chicago. Pittsburgh Steelers president Art Rooney praised the move by stating, the league never enjoyed any television revenue from Chicago games during the years the Cardinals played there. From now on, the Chicago situation will be the same as it is elsewhere in the league, he told the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. So, while the NFL owners happily congratulated one another on the opening of another revenue stream for themselves, the tidal wave of praise for the move swept over perhaps the most important segment of this transaction, the Chicago Cardinals fans. They were ignored, forgotten, and excluded from any part of the process, which of course is not unusual whenever an event of this type occurs. Still, fans simply wanted to know why. Why did the Cardinals leave? Did George Hallis push them out? Did the NFL force the move? Many theories have been exchanged over the years, but the two main reasons for the move were basically poor attendance and the TV blackout issue in Chicago. In the late 1950s, several home games for the Cardinals drew less than 20,000 fans for each game. The only team to attract a decent crowd was the Chicago Bears, and the Northsiders visited Comiskey Park just once a year. Less attendees equals financial issues, and the Cardinals were now facing that issue. With television revenue picking up elsewhere, the fact that neither the Bears nor the Cardinals could televise their games back at home was a distinct disadvantage but specific to the only city in the league at the time with two NFL teams. I was fortunate to interview the late Cardinals owner, Bill Bidwell, years ago and asked him about the reason for the move. His answer was short and precise. He told me basically it was because of television. It wasn't necessarily a move to anywhere, but a move out of Chicago because of the television problems. For the inconvenience, as mentioned, the Cardinals were presented with $500,000 to help cover expenses associated with the move, as well as pay off some lingering debt from the remodeling of Soldier Field when the Cardinals began playing home games there in 1959. As mentioned, George Hellas contributed wholeheartedly to the Cardinals' moving fund. The Chicago Tribune summarized the reasoning behind the move. It said, the move not only will leave the Bears as the only professional team in the nation's third largest market, but it opens up that territory to television. In the past, when neither the Cardinals or the Bears were at home, the Chicago area was blacked out. The Bears will now be able to televise their road games back to Chicago. Walter Wolfner contended that the purpose was to open up Chicago for TV. He made no mention of the visiting owners who resented accepting checks only for the flat guarantee in Chicago in exchange for checks well over the guarantee figure when the Cardinals played on the road. And so the Cardinals left for St. Louis in March of 1960, never to return. But what about their thousands of loyal fans? Many still blame Hells for the departure and they and their descendants have vowed never to cheer for the Bears. Others patiently followed the Cardinals wherever they might be, whether it be St. Louis or Arizona or now Phoenix. Still, a smaller portion switched their allegiance to Green Bay, while a majority eventually accepted the presence of the Chicago Bears as the team to cheer for in Chicago. There's one more story to share regarding the loss of the Cardinals. When their move to St. Louis was announced, their former landlord, Bill Veck of the Chicago White Sox, was determined to bring another professional football club to Comiskey Park. Veck attempted to secure a franchise in the new American Football League, but was unsuccessful in his efforts, leaving the Bears as the only representative of the pro football wars remaining in Chicago. Thank you for listening to this episode of When Football Was Football on the Sports History Network. Please join us next time for the strange but true tale of the first time when Green Bay came to Chicago. It was a clash of cultures, both on the field and in the streets. Thanks again for listening. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com.
We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.